And for those of us who have found that, we can say, praise the Lord. That works for me. Have, have a seat if you're with us here in the chapel. It's nice having more here singing. Love singing with you all. A year ago, we were in an empty chapel here. One of the strangest period of time in my life. To, For a few Sundays there, I came in this room and stood in front of a camera down here and tried to give a message. And it was weird. <laughs> it's not how it's supposed to work. And yet God in His goodness, thank you, things are opening up more and we, we need it. God is faithful. Amen. So, uh, a little, little local test here. I saw this out in my travels this week. The church is not far from here and it's not a frontal angle of it. They have massive forsythia. Anyone have a remote guess of where this church is? Nope. Sabatis. Sabatis. It is the Catholic Church. And um, I put it wrong in my notes. I was going to tell you what it is. Yes, it is. Our Lady of the Rosary. And uh, it's kind of sad to me. Uh, as I drove in to get the picture, I saw a church that's going into disrepair, a parking lot disrepair. I'm not saying that to be critical of them. Please don't, don't hear the critical. It's just a sad day we live in that faith is not important to people. And, hey, I'm a Protestant. I'm a protester. That's what Protestant means. I would have hopefully gone with Martin Luther and the others in the Reformation to say, no, there were abuses in the church that need to be corrected. And uh, that's the cycle of church history and much of uh, secular history is there's been abuses of power and people go, no more. We want it right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a revolutionary. I, I learned that God did not give me big fists, but he gave me long legs. When I was in school, I tried to run away from fights, not run into them. That's how I was, how I was wired. Now I got all the wise guys wound up here. I got to be careful. God is faithful. Um, let's shift gears then, since you don't like my history lesson. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow, amen? Okay, change the slide for me, please. Or is something else frozen? There we go. Um, I just got this from Mike Whitney. Their annual men's conference is coming right up. It's a couple weeks away. And as you'll see, if you can read it from there, it's at Main Street Baptist Church. Um, that is across from Parkview. They're hosting it this year. Um, the speaker is Carol Connolly, Conley from the Christian Civic League. Uh, the Civic League has now for 100 years fought to that the government should not impinge on Christian civil rights. Uh, it's more necessary than ever. Because when I say Christian civil rights, rights. I shouldn't even need the word Christian in front of the two words civil rights because we should all have the same civil rights. But when laws apparently seem to target groups like Christians, then we need another group that will go in there and argue in our behalf. So um, it'd be interesting what he gives. He keeps a close eye on Augusta and the politics there, um, probably from a little different spin than your local news network. So um, for guys, I think that's a great opportunity. It is the whole morning, unlike the other men's breakfast, which is just a breakfast with a short message. His is more of a workshop style. So um, if you are thinking of going, please let me know, and I'll let Mike know because they like a head count for breakfast. Okay, moving along. We are continuing our, our study of John's first letter. We call First John the Epistle of John. And... Uh, I love studying Scripture, and especially when I think of the personalities behind it. God speaks through people. He doesn't have to. And we know one time in the Old Testament, He couldn't find a person that would speak, so He used a donkey. So God can use whatever He wants, and that's okay. But I, I like the personality factor. John, when he was with Jesus, was one of the so-called sons of thunder. And when they were in a village and the, and the village did not receive Christ's ministry, some of you remember, what did James and John want to do to the village? Call down fire, Call down fire and toast them. Let's, let's move along, go to another village. This village isn't too cool. 
It certainly would have been cool if they got the fire. But anyway, so uh, Jesus didn't do that. That, that, was, <laughs> that was not the, the deal. But that was his personality. And then as I read through the Gospels, I see what I call the softening of John's heart. So he gets closer to Jesus. He is getting real close. He's there at the Mount of Transfiguration. He sees Jesus all in his glory, and it's totally overwhelming. We know Peter speaks up there, but John is processing this. We know John is the one that actually follows through and stands there at the cross when Christ is dying, stands there with his mother and the other, other women who are involved basically in the ministry and care of the disciples. And so John was there, and John writes this before, as far as we know, before he gets the last book of the Bible revealed to him, Jesus revealed the revelation of Jesus Christ. John's an older man. He's been a pastor. He's been an author, writes that beautiful long gospel we call the book of John. He's processed a lot, and he's gonna, he suffers persecution. He's going to be put in exile soon after he writes these words. What he sees going on in the church, and it might have been Ephesus, he had pastored in Ephesus, is false teachings coming in and undermining the work of Christ, undermining the actual identity of Christ and watering it down in an extremely dangerous way. And so Paul writes, uh, Paul, John writes addressing that. He's saying, no, don't buy into the bad arguments. Remember what I've taught you, what I saw, what I've heard, what I've experienced. So we're continuing that. Today we're in chapter wrong direction. Today we're in, oh, that's cool. I'm ready to sing, but I'm not quite ready. Is my, is my, my unit going backwards when it should go forwards? It's always possible. This works. This works. So right now you can say to me, thank you. I needed to hear that. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't feeling the love for a minute there. I was just wondering what's going on. You are loved. John's going to talk about that. And what he talks about after that has to reflect back to this positional truth is that you are loved. And then the second thing that he has to reemphasize to these early believers is that we will be like Jesus. That's a really loaded statement. What's, what's he mean? How does that work? He's going to talk some more about sin. Man, John, get over it. Why does he keep writing about sin? We'll have to look at that. And he's going to talk about the source of sin, the devil and sin. And actually, in doing so, he gives us a better understanding of how this whole thing works, our sin, Satan's involvement, but also Christ's work, which is huge. And he reminds us we are to do the right thing, do what's right. So I'm going to be reading this morning from the New International Version translation again. And just opening the opening half of chapter 3. And it's, it's a great passage. So here we go. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now are we children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know something. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that He appeared so that He might take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. Oh, man. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. 
Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. And by the way, that introduces another thought. So let's break this apart a little bit. Some very challenging words, and like so much of Scripture, if we understand it correctly, and that's my goal, and that doesn't mean I do all the time. I'm in a process of learning Scripture, trying to understand Scripture. But if the best we can, we understand it and apply it, great things. But when we misunderstand Scripture and misapply it, not good things happen. Not good things happen. So there are some verses in here that are challenging, and I, by God's grace, I hope I can explain them to, uh, in such a way that they are, number one, spiritual, and i.e. by the Spirit, and not just by my opinion. My opinion is very helpful when it comes to things like cars and chocolate. But it, with Scripture, we need to know what the Spirit of God is looking for. Amen? Okay, first off, you are loved. Soak that in for a second. You are loved. You good with that? Are you? I hope so. I think a lot of people aren't. A lot of people aren't. People I talk to that have been given uh, a bad picture of who God is, a horrible picture of who Jesus Christ is, churches that have hurt people instead of helped people, they do not know that God loved them so much that He would send His only Son into the world, not to condemn the world, John would write in his gospel, but to save the world. You are loved. And we have a little chorus we've sung for years, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called. It's a great chorus, but what I don't like about the chorus is to me this should be to epic music. <laughs> it should have a symphonic sound to it. What great love the Father has lavished on us. This should just be, you know, timpani roll, the whole thing. Because we miss it. We miss it. We don't know how loved we are. And because we fail to know how loved we are, then we're all over the map. And we think we have to win God's love. What a lie that is. It's a horrible lie. You cannot win God's love because He already loves you. He already loves you. He can't love you anymore. He won't love you any less. That is, that is what Scripture teaches. That we should be called children of God, and that is what we are it's interesting, the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, and Greek verb tensing, you linguists out there, is very specific. That is what we are. This is not a future tense word. It is not what we will be, because we're going to be transformed. John gets to that, but we are what? We are loved. And in the Greek, they can't come up with a good word that shows how great this love is that God's poured out on us. It's lavished on us. It's a lot. It's not a little bit sprinkled. It's there. It's just like, you know, you ever get the hot fudge Sunday at McDonald's? They do not lavish it with the hot fudge. It doesn't work that way. And so when I'm eating it, I'm trying to make the hot fudge last. To the, it's too much vanilla ice cream. I want more hot fudge. God is not that way. God lavishes His love. If you don't take anything else home, take home that you are loved. Say it over and over again in the car. Wake up tomorrow morning and say, whether you're alone or you've got a house full of kids, I am loved. I am loved by the Creator God who wanted me to be with Him so badly that He sent His Son to die in my place. If you know that, if you believe that, that is huge. It is huge. There are people struggling, and I'm sorry to say in the world we live in, rightly so, with depression. They're struggling with discouragement. They're struggling that there is no hope. And meanwhile, all the time, there's the God of love who says, there is hope in my son, Jesus Christ. It's so important. We are right now children of God. And you say, well, Pastor Ron, I've made a mess out of things. I did this. I said this. God knows all that. You're still loved. And that's the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the cross is we come he, what we studied in the first lesson, if we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants to forgive us. He doesn't want to hold it against us. And then the next promise here is we will become like Jesus. I find that a scary thought. We will be like Jesus. I'm trying to picture some of you just like Jesus. It's not working. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know you well enough. I think there's a difference. You're not, you, once in a while I see glimpses of Jesus in you. I hope once in a while you see glimpses of Jesus in me. I think that's how it's supposed to work. As we yield ourselves to Him and His Spirit starts to work in our minds and hearts, we once in a while don't react in the flesh and we're a little bit, tiny bit more like Jesus. But for most of us, there's a ways to go and that's okay. That's why John had to t tell us, he had to remind us, now we are children of God. We don't know all that, how it's going to come to be, but that's who we are. But then there's this promise. We know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, because we won't see a representation, we won't see a distorted image, we will see Him what? As He is, the real deal, not an imposter. And John, John's writing to counter the, the error that was weaseling its way into the church then was Jesus was not fully man or was fully man, but not fully God or vice versa. Jesus was just a spirit being, so that's why he could do things. And John's going, no, that's not the Jesus I knew. That's why he starts, reread again chapter 1. He starts by saying, that which we've seen and know and experienced, I know this guy. I know him. I was with him. Don't buy that false stuff. He was fully man. He was fully God. Now you say, well, he didn't word it that way, but he explains it that way. You can't, you can't get a Savior unless he's both of those. And that's the problem with some of the false so-called Christian churches. They do not cheat, teach that Jesus is fully God and fully man, so he can't be your Savior. And if you haven't got a Savior, what are you going to do? You're going to try harder, and you're going to try harder, and you're going to try harder. And you know what happens? You'll burn out, you'll be frustrated, and you'll walk away bitter and rejected and angry, and then somebody comes to you and says, you need Jesus, you want to punch him in the face. Because you've been given a bad deal. And I don't blame them. The people that have wanted to punch me in the face, I wonder who has hurt you in falsely, incorrectly in the name of Jesus. That's a bad, bad place to be. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. There's the first of the tricky verses. What does that look like? Purifies Himself just as He is pure. Well, when I look at it, I go, Jesus is pure. I've got that. I really believe, as Scripture says, He lived a sinless life. Even though he was tempted as we are, yet without sin, Scripture says. But I'm to purify myself. How does that work? Well, let's try to take this apart a little bit. And I can tell you, before I take it apart, I haven't got this down 100% yet. I think that moment, I get pretty close to it, I'll be out of here. The Lord will call me home before I mess up again. So, I'm in process, working on this like you are. So he has to talk more about sin. Everyone who sins break the law, and then he defines sin as what? Lawlessness. Don't tell me what to do. The greatest sin isn't the sin itself. Work with me on this just a little bit. Because if you don't identify the sin and what's behind it, then you won't get the help. You won't go for the remedy. You won't go to the doctor and find what you need. You know that He appeared. This is where John's going. He appeared that He might take away our sins, because in Him is no sin. No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. Okay, so here's number, uh, the next verse there. Four, five, six. That's the second of the tricky verses. How does this work? Last I looked in the mirror, I can say, I'm still struggling with sin. Anyone else have that problem? It's not the mirror's problem. <laughs> Don't blame your mirror. There's a heart problem. The Bible's very clear. The problem with Ronnie, the problem with you, is not in the vessel that pumps blood. Doctors can more or less deal with that. But it's that the spirit being, that eternal part of us, that basically says, God's given us this right that says, I am free to choose something. And what will I choose? And how will I choose that? What will I do? What directs me into that? No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. As one of my uh, New England Bible College profs said, and I'm pretty sure it was Roger Blundell, but um, my kids have had him too. I think he said something like, Christians will continue to struggle with sin as long as we have pulse, but the fun has been taken out of it. You feel pretty badly afterwards like, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have said that, I shouldn't have thought that, because sin is always thought, 
word, or deed. It falls into those categories that you can't escape just because it's a thought sin. Jesus makes that really clear in the Sermon on the Mount. So the sin struggle, you'll know God's Spirit's around because you are prompted, and it's not from your, just your conscience. That's, a, that's an overbeat up word. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you're not just running by your conscience. That, that doesn't happen. God's, God's too good to us to let that happen. He gives us His Spirit, and His Spirit is the coach, the counselor. And He goes, either don't do that, or if we go ahead and do it because we're still self-willed, He goes, you shouldn't have done that, and you've got to do something about it. So there's a corrective there that doesn't happen without God's help. By nature, I will choose to sin because I will be, I don't want someone telling me what to do. Don't tell me a law. You know, some of us, what's the speed limit mean? <laughs> There's going to be a lot of answers on that one. It's just recommended. <laughs> and um, yeah, okay, don't, we can't, you'll beat that one up a long time. But when you, as soon as you say, I'm telling you what to do, a lot of us, we're just wired, our sin nature takes over and says, no, you're not telling me what to do. And so even when God, who created us and knows what's best for us, knows what will make us, yes, happy, yes, and we go, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm like the two-year-old that thinks, I well, can't put my fingers in the wall socket, and it's no big deal. It is a big deal. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him, because that you keep on sinning because the, the spirit, the regulator, the one who convicts isn't there and present. So why does John write so much about sin? I was puzzling that this week. Often when I'm teaching Scripture and I'm going over it, I say, Lord, why did you want me to teach this? I, there's some other passages I like better. Let's do one of those. And then God says, no, let's teach some of the hard ones. In fact, I've thought about a summer series, and you could be thinking about this too. I thought my summer series would be Scriptures I Don't Like. And I'll just do a series of hard verses that I don't know what to do with, and we can commiserate together and then go home and say, uh-oh, now we know we got to what we got to do. I don't know. We'll see. I wrote this answer, because sin stinks. Now, if you, some of you that have had COVID, your sense of smell's not back. That's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? There were times when I had kids and grandkids, I wished my nose didn't work. It was diaper time, right? You, you don't like that. Someone told me they had an incident at their workplace this week where the power went off, probably because of an accident, and at the workplace, they have to pump the sewage uphill. The pumps were down. Guess what happens? They're part of a commercial establishment and the pumps are down. It's not a good day. Not a good day. Um, years ago, we had an incident in our house. I wasn't home. I was up in New Hampshire at a church convention, but the septic line that runs across our basement, the plastic septic line, we didn't know this. It had backed up and it got so heavy, it broke open. And I'm very grateful for a brother in Christ who come over and clean that up for Lois and for the family because not a... Sin stinks. If the, as soon as I start telling you these stories, you can almost smell the bad stuff. It happens. You know, we have an orifactory memory. You know, it, uh, since I've been involved with fire and rescue, you know, propane doesn't smell like propane except that they scent it. And they don't scent it like roses or whatever. When they, if you can smell propane, there's a problem. There's something wrong. But there are other gases you can't smell. We have to go in with a meter. But if something doesn't smell right, it probably isn't right. You ever open a can of milk, a jar of milk that's been in the fridge a little too long? You, you may see a difference in it, but before you do, if you take the cap off, what will you, your nose will tell you, this is not good, don't drink it. Sin stinks. The very nature of it stinks. Now, bear with me in this. All sin, even tiny ones, have a horrible stench. But we get used to it. They call it what we do is orifactory memory. So if I have a slight propane leak in my house, after I've been in the house five or ten minutes, do you think I can still smell it? I can't. I've lost it. Even though there's a memory of it, I get dulled to it, and however the brain does it, it starts masking it. It's still dangerous. you still got to get out of there. you still got to call the fire department to run a meter to find where it is. But what happens to us is, even with our tiny sins, we're used to it. We're used to it. When I work in the ambulance, we bring people in sometimes that don't smell good. I'm putting it very simply. I think they're used to it. Doesn't bother them. Bothers me. 
And our sins are something like this. We get used to our little sins. They don't bother us. But before a holy God, they still smell bad, real bad. And it's not that He's out to get us. He wants to help us. He, you know, the whole point about good smells and being clean and being healthy. See, here's the problem with sin. It always impacts somebody. It hurts me. It hurts others. And ultimately, as David wrote out so beautifully, when David had committed adultery and committed organized murder, against the only have I sinned, he would write. And I remember reading that when I was young, thinking, what on earth are you talking about? You've made a mess of families, of the nation. No, he knows ultimately my sin is against my Creator God. Sin is lawlessness. But there's an opposite thing that's true. Holiness, holiness smells really, really nice. I remember uh, years ago reading through a number of times I've read through the Old Testament. When they talked about the offerings, do you remember what the result of the offering was? There was a smell to it. And if I get out to my grill this afternoon, later today, and I put some beef on there, sorry if you're vegan or vegetarian, but the smell should still be attractive to you. Regardless, when you're cooking that meat on the grill, it smells really good. The offering was to have a sweet smell, and interestingly enough, it said so before God. A sweet smell versus a stinky one. Sin stinks. This is why John's talking about it, writing about it. He sees it infecting the church, and he says, don't let it happen. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. And know the source. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Sin, going against God. So that brings us to what Jesus had to do to deal with it. He had to go on the cross. The reason the Son of God appeared John would write, was to destroy the devil's work. Sin in my heart. Sin in your heart. It's a process. Our salvation is the moment we put our faith in Christ. The transformative process of becoming more like Christ, that's an ongoing thing. So choose to do what's right. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. And by the way, use your Bibles Measure, filter what I'm saying or anybody else says. If it's not biblical, I need to know. You need to know. You know, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And then I'm jumping down to 10. This is how we know. Anyone who doesn't do what is right can't be God's child, and especially when it comes to love. And so we'll, we're, that's the next lesson, how we look at that. I thought of a couple of verses as I was going through this. I was trying to bridge what John would write because he's dealing with a specific problem that's come into the church, false teaching that enabled sin because the false teachers basically said, your behavior doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. Do what you want. Who cares? And John's going, no, no, no. That's not what Jesus taught. That's not how it works. You'll hurt yourself. You'll hurt others. It's, it's horrible before God. It stinks. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. I really believe Paul did. I'll find out when I get there that others are wrong that think it was somebody else. But anyway, I don't, you don't care and I don't either really. But this is what he would write. He writes about the heroes of faith who died in the faith, some of them pretty horrible deaths. But the writer of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. And what's the next phrase? Sin that so easily entangles. You ever been fishing with me? Some of you have. I can tangle a line I can, it's just weird. I can tangle a line without hardly moving it. And tangles are easy. What about untangles? Not easy with lightweight monofilament or whatever. They're, they're just miserable. Sin, I just think that's such a descriptive phrase. Sin easily entangles. If you're struggling in sin, don't let Satan lie to you. You're the only one. You're bad. Nobody can help you. There's no way out. Satan uses that over and over again with the human race. It's a horrible lie. Of course there's help. That's why Jesus came. Of course there's forgiveness. Of course there's grace. There's love. There's mercy. That's, that's who God is. That's why Jesus came. So get stuff that's hindering us out of the way because it just easily entangles and then he says, you can't do it if you're tangled up. Nobody runs tangled up. You've got to be untangled to run. Run with perseverance, the race marked before us, 
And how do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Him, the author and perfecter of our faith. And then I thought of two other verses. Now, these are Paul's for sure from Romans. And I, I love these verses. There's a few chapters between them because Paul, in writing out Romans, breaks down in his best detail the work of Christ and our problem of sin. He, he spends a I don't know how much time he spent getting it ready, but he breaks it apart. This is our sin nature. This is why we need God's Spirit. This is how it works. But his conclusion after chapters, especially 6 and 7, is he's breaking down the struggle of the flesh, my human nature, and the, and the work of the Spirit. He concludes after saying, who will deliver me out of this bondage, this problem? Praise be to God. So then he concludes with a therefore. Therefore, because what Jesus did, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Friends, that is huge. It is absolutely huge. You say, well, Pastor Ron, you don't know what I'm struggling with. I know who Jesus is, and I know there's help. I know who Jesus is, and I know there's help. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can get the help you need. Forgiveness has already been purchased on the cross by His blood. And then I'll jump to Romans 12. Again, he is looked at in uh, at 10 and 11. He's looked actually, is there any benefit to being a Jew? And he's breaking all that apart. But then he gives this strong recommendation. That's why he uses the word, I urge you. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of this work of grace that God's done, God's mercy, the work of the cross, that our response should be that we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and proper worship. And then he gives this command, it's in the imperative, do not conform to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world? Lawlessness. That's the pattern of this world because Satan's behind that. It's not just against civil law and all that. We can talk about that's different. It's about submitting to the ultimate authority, God Himself. That's the lawlessness He's talking about. Satan is in rebellion against God Almighty. Do not conform, but this is what has to happen. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what's been happening for the last whatever minutes we've been here. Our minds are being renewed because we're focusing on God's Word. And God's Word, the writer of Hebrews says, is not just another book. It's living and active, sharper. It gets in. So if you're letting God's Word in, there's, a, there's good stuff that's happening there. Don't conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm glad... R.C. The late R.C. Sproul, that was the name of his program, Renewing Your Minds, and he was right on the money with that. So let me, let me wind this up. You are what? You are loved. I am loved with this huge, great, unstoppable, this love without limits, love without boundaries. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are, and that is what? You are. You are. If you're having an inner argument now, and some of you will be, I know what that's like. No, no, I, I'm, I don't think I am because dot, dot, dot. I would ask you to, to answer that with, no, I am loved. I am loved. God's Word says so. Jesus demonstrated how great that Father's love was was for me when He came to earth, when He lived that life, when He died on the cross, and when He rose again from the grave. You are loved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your faithfulness proves your love. <laughs> Everything around us proves your love if we'll stop and look at it. We are loved, God. Yeah, we struggle with our sin nature. We know us almost as good as maybe you do, probably not quite. But there is a remedy. The cross is the remedy. You have died for all sin for all time. So out of love, Lord, we want to walk with you, not out of fear, not out of the law telling us, because we know we're loved by such a powerful, deep, personal, gracious love. It's been lavished on us that we respond back in love and worship to you, 
And then as John will explain further, in love to others. That's, it's, it breaks us. Leads to sin, lawlessness, the thing that's against you. It's in rebellion against you. And it stinks. It stinks. But your grace is wonderful. Your mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. All because of your great love. Amen. I pray you'll renew that in our minds and hearts, not just while we're in here in the room together, but tomorrow when things are going, eh, bad Monday or whatever. No, you, we're loved. It's been lavished on us. We have the power of your spirit. We can overcome through your precious blood and your Holy Spirit, dear Jesus. Or whatever the challenges are, you are faithful. You are faithful. Hallelujah. Never once did we ever walk alone. We didn't know it all the time, but you were there because you're the faithful one. We love you, Lord. Amen? Okay, if you be seated, we'll take up a couple things for a couple minutes.